Okay, so here we are. The equivalence point of a weak asset titrated with a strong base. This particular point in the titration curve occurs when you have added the exact amount of millimoles of base as you do have acid to begin with. So if you add 5 ml of hydroxide, you will add a total of 0.5 millimoles of hydroxide base, which is equal to the 0.5 millimoles of acid that we had to begin with. So if you apply your mice table, what you're going to see right here is that you have the exact amount of both reactants, so automatically the change is going to be simply negative 0.5 for the reactants and positive 0.5 for the product. But when you carry out the actual subtraction, 0.5 minus 0.5 is 0, 0 plus 0.5 is 0.5. All right, so you have generated conjugate base, which is good. But the problem is that you have run out of conjugate acid. You don't have any more conjugate acid. Um, you added exactly the same amount of hydroxide that you needed to fully remove it, which is the reason why you are at the equivalence point. But the problem is this. Because you do not have the conjugate acid present, this cannot be a buffer anymore. All right? So lacking the presence of the conjugate acid means that this cannot be a buffer. And check this out. Look at our good old gerbil friends here. This is not a buffer. Do you hear me? Oh man, yeah, not a buffer, right? <laughs> so yeah, even they are surprised. Like, oh, what the heck? So what are we going to do? Well, what we're going to do is um, account for the fact that all we have right now present in water is nitrite. 0.5 millimoles of nitrite to be exact. So what that means is that now we have to consider the reactivity of nitrite with water. All right, so that also means that nitrite reacting with water nitrite being the base the conjugate base generating some of its conjugate acid in the process and water behaving as the acid generating some hydroxide in the process what this really means is that we are going to have to switch over back to concentration because we can't use the henderson hasselbalch equation that equation can only be used when you're dealing with a buffer and this is no longer a buffer so we are in essence dealing with the base dissociation equation which requires us to switch over from millimoles back to concentration. Yes, concentration indeed. So we're going to divide the 0.5 millimoles of nitrite by the total volume. And you may recall that we have added 5 ml total of hydroxide to a 50 ml solution of HNO2. So the total volume is in fact 55. So we're going to divide the 0.5 millimoles by the total volume, which is 55 ml. And as long as you divide millimoles by milliliters, you will end up with molarity. So 0.5 divided by 55 is 9.09 .09 times 10 to the negative 3. And just to confirm, if you look at that value, that value is indeed smaller than the initial concentration we had, as it should be, because you technically diluted the concentration somewhat by adding the 5 ml of hydroxide. All right, now that we have the concentration what this means is that we have to now switch over to the traditional ice table and yes because we're doing an ice table we can no longer use a, you know or you know, rely on our you know rodent friends right here so we're going to switch over back to an ice table okay and so NO2 is the reactant the other reactant is water we don't include that the product is HNO2 and hydroxide the change is going to be back in terms of x so we have minus x for nitrite plus X for HNO2, and plus X for hydroxide, meaning that the equilibrium concentrations are 9.09 .09 times 10 to negative 3 minus X, and plus X and plus X for the products. Okay, so when we set up this equation, we have products over reactants, so X times X, which is X squared, divided by 9.09 .09 times 10 to negative 3 minus X. But this is the important feature about this problem, and this is one thing that becomes a very common mistake for students to make. Mainly the idea that they forget that when they have reached the equivalence point and they're switching over to the ice table, you're not dealing with the acid reacting with water anymore. In fact, you're now dealing with a conjugate base reacting with water. So the equation that we're going to set up as an equilibrium expression is not the Ka expression, it's actually the Kb. So we need to switch over from the Ka to the Kb value. 
And there's two ways to do that. You could divide the 4.0 times 10 to the negative 4 from 10 to the negative 14. That will give you the KV value. Or you could use the pKa, subtract it from 14 to get the pKv, and then take the anti-log of the pKv, 10 to the negative pKv, to generate the KV value itself. All that being said, when you set up your equilibrium expression for the equivalence point, you have to use the KV value. You have to because you're reacting the conjugate base with water. By definition, that's the KV equilibrium expression. So we're not using 4 times 10 to negative 4, we're using 2.51 times 10 to negative 11 equals x squared over 9.09 .09 times 10 to negative 3 minus x. And aside from that complexity, usually, not always, but usually what's going to take place is that the value of the initial concentration of your conjugate base is in fact going to be a lot larger than the KB value. Right? In this case, 10 to negative 3 divided by 10 to negative 11 is roughly in the vicinity of, of 100 million. So this is guaranteed to be way greater than 400. So we're going to disregard the minus x. And all that we need to do now is multiply 2.51 times 10 to negative 11 by 9.09 .09 times 10 to negative 3. That will equal x squared. If you take the square root, that will give you a value of 4.78 times 10 to the negative 7 for the value of x. And now here is another common mistake that people make. They might actually do all this correctly, and then they get to x, and they automatically take the negative log of it and call it a day. And even though we are going to take the negative log of this value, what needs to be kept in mind is that the value of x does not correspond to the hydronium concentration. It now corresponds to the hydroxide concentration. So when you take the negative log of this, you don't get the pH, instead you get the pOH. So the thing that needs to be remembered is that now you need to subtract this value from 14 to get the pH itself. And one thing that will kind of give it away that maybe you have forgotten to do this last step is that when you're titrating weak acids with strong bases, the pH at the equivalence point has to be greater than 7. So if you took a negative log of X and forgot to check with your I stable, that in fact you were dealing with hydroxide, you're going to get a value that is less than 7. And that should tell you, oh, wait a minute, that doesn't make sense, because the equivalence point of a weak acid, uh, the pH at the equivalence point of a weak acid has to be greater than 7. So that will tell you, oh, you probably need to subtract this from 14, because you're dealing with the pOH and not the pH. So when you apply that change, you can see here clearly that the pH is indeed greater than 7. So that's the pH at the equivalence point. And the other thing that you can see from this graph is that not only has the pH increased, but by the time you reach the equivalence point, instead of changing the pH value by 0.2 units or 0.6 you know, units, now you change that by a whooping 3.68 units. So the change in pH now is very drastic because you no longer have a buffer. All right. So that's how you go about calculating the equivalence point of a buffer. In the next lecture, I'm going to show you another example that hopefully will help to uh, strengthen your understanding of how to calculate the pH at the equivalence point. And like I said before, uh, using the right indicator when doing this type of problems is kind of important. Now, notice that, going back to this, the pK at the equivalence point, excuse me, the pH at the equivalence point is 7.68. So when you go choosing your indicator, you want to choose an indicator that roughly changes color in the vicinity of 7.68, which is somewhere around here. So looking at this table, a lysering could do the trick that changes close enough to that value. Uh, Bromothymol blue also looks okay. And maybe, maybe phenol red, although that might be a little bit more on the funky side because you're changing from orange to red. So that might not be a very clear indication of a color change. But bromothymol blue looks pretty good. Phenol red, red, that's kind of a maybe. All right, so that's kind of how you pick your indicators based, based on the pH value that you're calculating for the equivalence point. Now I'm going to show you one last part, which is the calculation past the equivalence point. This is when you add more base than you need to to fully titrate away the conjugate acid that you started with. So if you end up adding a total of 70 ml, what that will tell you is that you will have 0.7 millimoles of hydroxide. You still start with the 0.5 millimoles of acid that you had to begin with. But when you apply your mice table, 
the limiting reactant is no longer hydroxide. The limiting reactant now is HNO2. So you have to subtract 0.5 from both reactants and add 0.5 to the product. If you were to subtract 0.7 from both, you will end up with a negative concentration at the end of this, which makes no sense. So make sure to go with the limiting reactant between the two reactants present in here. At the end of the story, you still have no conjugate acid left, so this is not a buffer problem. But you are going to have some hydroxide left over in solution, and I'm going to show you how that ultimately affects the calculation. First, I'm going to switch over back to an ice table because we no longer have a buffer. So I'm going to change the millimoles of the nitrite and the hydroxide that we have left over. And notice that I have already switched back to a base dissociation equation. Nitrate plus water reacting to give you HNO2 and hydroxide. We have an initial amount of hydroxide left over, that's the excess amount, and we have an amount of nitrate that we have produced in the course of the titration. Now we have to divide this by the total volume, and the total volume right now is 57, right? 50 plus 7, so we divide both numbers by 57. You find out that the concentrations are 8.77 times 10 to negative 3 and 3.51 times 10 to negative 3. Now, we apply the change in concentration, which for a nice table is minus x and plus x for reactants and products, respectively. And now you end up with the following expressions. Okay. Now, applying this to the Kb of HNO2, which we already determined to be 2.51 times 10 to negative 11, if we apply this as an expression, we have the concentration of HNO2 times the concentration of hydroxide divided by the concentration of NO2 minus. What you can see right here is that 10 to the negative 3 divided by 10 to the negative 11 is going to be, once again, in the order of 100 million, which is way more than 400. So the plus x and the minus x are actually going to be discarded. The only x that remains is the one that's being multiplied. Right? So plus and minus x's can be disregarded if you have a ratio value of greater than 400. Uh, so what ends up happening is that if you multiply 2.51 times 10 to 11 by 8.77 times 10 to negative 3 and divide it by 3.51 times 10 to negative 3, the value of x that we obtain is 6.27 times 10 to the negative 11. And this is one mistake that people can make, and hopefully you won't. But if you take the negative log of this and call it a day in terms of the POH, you'll be making a huge mistake because x is not the concentration of hydroxide. X is the change to the concentration of hydroxide. Hydroxide already had an original concentration to begin with. And looking at this, you will realize that a value times 10 to the negative 3 is a lot bigger than the value times 10 to the negative 11. So this plus X for hydroxide is literally inconsequential. The hydroxide concentration pretty much remains 3.51 times 10 to the negative 3, which means that if after performing your ice table, excuse me, your mice table calculation, you take the millimoles of hydroxide divided by the total volume and take the negative log of that value, you will automatically get the pOH, which of course subtracted from 14 uh, will allow you to get the pH value. So long story short, when it comes down to the mice table of this problem, the moment you have there we go. The moment you have the millimoles of the hydroxide in excess, all you have to do is completely forget about the nitrite. As you saw from the calculation, it's going to make very little difference in terms of the hydroxide concentration. Also, all you have to do is take the 0.2 millimoles that we have here, divided by 57 to get to the concentration. And once you have this concentration, simply take the negative log of it and subtract it from 14, and you will automatically get to the pH. So that will save you the problem of fully performing an ice table. All right, and with that, we have the entire picture of the titration curve. We have the initial point of 2.74. We have four uh, pH values within the buffer region. We have found the equivalence point pH, which is greater than 7. And now we have found the pH past the equivalence point. So, the you know, upon having excess hydroxide added, which shoots up really high in pH as a result of having so much hydroxide base present. All right, so that's it for the titrations. On the next lecture, I'm going to show you one more example of titrations. This point uh, using a weak base in conjunction with a strong acid. So it'll be the same approach, but applied to 
the counterpart, the weak base counterpart. So I'll see you in the next lecture series.